Okay, Pilates Elephants World, great to be with you again. I am here with Heath Lander. Hi, Heath. Hi, Raf. Great to be with you. You too, mate. Um, so we are going to talk today about the fact, the incontrovertible fact, that there are only three exercises in the world and cat stretch is two of them. <laughs> uh, actually, that sounds a little bit flippant, but it's actually quite a, quite a serious and nuanced topic that we're going to talk about today. Uh, which is really, I guess, we, another way we could sum it up is like how your teaching journey and how you've come, or really your journey around programming and how you have developed your thinking around programming over the last decade uh, and got to a place where you've created a really simple framework that enables you to build challenge for pretty much any client starting from anywhere on the spectrum from just had surgery to athletic, you know, high, high performing. Uh, and you can start them where they're at and progress them to whatever the next level is for them. Um, and in there, we are going to weave it back to there are only three exercises in the world and two of them are cat stretch. Um, so can you introduce yourself uh, to the, the Pilates stratosphere, please? Sure. Um, my name's Heath Lander. Uh, I'm a Pilates instructor. <clears throat> um, I work at Breathe Education and have done since shortly after completing my training. Uh, in fact, I think basically from the inception of that organisation. Uh, so I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, an instructor trainer as well. And I also run a studio with my partner called White Dog Studio, uh, named after my big white dog. Um, we've been doing, I've been doing that for bit over 10 years now, which started in my living room, uh, grew into a small room in the back of an osteopathy clinic and eventually grew into its own studio. Um, I've taught uh, basically all of the versions of Pilates, a group reformer, group mat, clinical, small group. Um, the bulk of what I've done, I've taught, I calculated the other day, I'm getting up around 60,000 hours of face to, of teaching to the public not including my instructor training um and most of that's been group reformer um, and when you say group reformer how, uh, what do you mean yeah group reformer so well i started out working at breathe well-being um when i was training and that was 20 beds then i when i started out on my own it was three beds then five beds then eight beds then nine beds then 12 beds then 15 beds and now we're back to 13 beds um, yeah, so, uh, and I understand that that's a reasonably high number of beds, broadly speaking, across the, in, you know, the global Pilates industry. And that's, that's where I've, so I, I think what I've developed as my skill is getting a reasonably large number of people on reformers, having a workout that hits them in the right spots with it, without leaving anyone behind uh, as often as possible and giving challenge to the people who are at the top end of the, the capacity in the room. Mm. Um, yeah. I, I think that I think it's also fair to say that you've got quite a considerable amount of expertise on working on the other equipment, like you've taught the individual clients and you know, two and three groups of two, three, four and five on the Cadillac, the barrels, the chairs, all of that stuff, you know, for donkey's years yeah and also the whole time you're at the osteopathy clinic from memory you basically only had the floor and a couple of spring walls that's right so, yeah so like this is not specific it's um, although you do spend most of your time teaching on reformers uh you've done you've done the whole lot yeah 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 so i spent a lot of time teaching clinical so and mean the but meaning by that uh the apparatus chair cadillac um ladder wall uh spring walls and for the last eight years or so, quite personally obsessed with um, how to, the, the gymnastic ladder, which as far as I'm concerned is basically uh, the same as the end of the Cadillac. Like I think the, the end of the Cadillac is not quite as good as the ladder. <laughs> um, Controversial statement, considering a ladder is <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. a quarter yeah. of the well, price you know, of the Cadillac. You can do more with the ladder than you can with the end of the Cadillac, but everything you can do with the end of the Cadillac, you can do with a ladder. Mm. So it's a more, fle more, 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 more flexible tool. So yeah, I, I absolutely love that. It's just by, by volume of teaching hours, I've spent the majority doing reformer. Even though when I started my own business, it was clinical and I did 
a lot of small groups, but just by the, the as the years progressed, the reform of volume of teaching outweighed the clinical. Mm. So uh, this all started for you when you uh, with well, in terms of this kind of progression of your journey um, that we're working up to, there only being three exercises in the world and cat stretch being two of them, sort of all started, well, you tell me, how did it all start? Where, where did you start with it? What was, what, was the, what was the point of confusion or problem that, <laughs> that you were struggling with? Um, all right, so I, I, think it, I think it started at its earliest would have been um, running small groups way back in the beginning. Uh, so this is like three or four clients in a session, each, each person a, doing their own, their own workout, own each program. Each person doing their own workout. <clears throat> um, and it was in, a, in the breathe studio that was, you know, fully maxed out with equipment. There's two Cadillacs, four reformers, ladder barrel, two chairs, all of the arc barrels and so on. So basically an embarrassment of riches. Like there was so many things to choose from. Um, Not to mention all the TRXs, BOSUs, pull-up right. bars, bands, balls, etc. Et yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and running, a, running a, essentially running around moving people from apparatus to apparatus um, and trying to find a rationale for what I was doing with them outside of what they believed was the problem or their postural set of predictive exercise, you know, because they had this posture, do these exercises. And then there was a moment once where I was thinking through, um, I was sitting trying to, th I was thinking through those postural types that I'd been taught to think in. And it Who was, taught you those posture types? Oh, uh, that'd be you, mate, as part of this <laughs> Pilates training. <laughs> yeah, kyphosis, lordosis, way yeah. back. Kyphosis, yeah, lordosis, right. flat back, military, and, 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 you know, one of the things that we did in our course was simmer that down and say, all right, there's four different posture types, but there's two different post pelvic positions. There's anterior yeah. tilt and posterior tilt. And if it's an anterior tilt, you need to do X and Y. Let's not get bogged down in what they were. And if it's a posterior tilt, you need to do the X and Y, which is the opposite. And one day I was teaching shoulder bridge and I was thinking, God, who's this good for? Who's this good for? And I was doing these shoulder bridges and I was thinking, and I was like, hold on a minute. It's fucking good for everyone. Wait a minute. It does, it does both things at the same time. And then I was like, oh, maybe there's more exercises that do that. And uh, that was, the, that was the, the, the moment where I kind of went, oh, wait a minute if you're moving through full range in both directions, everything that you're freaking out about in terms of muscle activation and length is just disappears. You don't have to think about it anymore. You just do the thing. Um, right. and so we could, so we could, in a in essence, we could do an exercise to, you know, lengthen the hip flexors and a different exercise to strengthen the glutes, a different exercise to strengthen the abs and a different exercise to strengthen the lumbar extensors. And then we, or we could just do an exercise that, works the whole body through full range and then we've done all of that right and particularly in flexion extension because right. you know most of the lateral systems contribute to some degree to flexion and extension right so all of the muscles that bend your side so all of your obliques for example bend your sideways and quadratus lumborum there well quadratus lumborum are involved in extension and oblique, obliques are involved in flexion uh, and if you think about like in, yeah, the same in the, 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 the hip muscles, you know, the gluteus maximus and the posterior gluteus medius that are abductors of the hip are also extensors of the hip. And the TFL and anterior gluteus medius that are flexors of the hip are also abductors of the hip. So basically, it's you, you know, when we talk about the flexors versus the abductors, there's not like actually two completely separate groups of muscles. There's like, it's basically like a double-sided jacket that you can just flip inside out and you know, it's like, it's the, it's the same. It's the same guy or same girl. Mm. Um, yeah. All right. So you realize that uh, where you, instead of uh, doing what I would call counting, counting the feet and dividing by four, you could basically just, instead of, you know, in, in other words, targeting each individual muscle or muscle group, you could just kind of find an exercise that worked the whole body through flexion and extension and bada bing, bada boom, you didn't have to like target anything because you'd targeted everything. Hmm. So and it's sort of like a carp carpet bombing approach. Yeah. And, and, and that they would work then as a system distributing load through the system appropriately for the system. So you might not be doing bicep curls to really pick on the biceps, but you'd be asking the biceps to work 
amongst the system and distribute the load accordingly. Which and, is know, really the biceps' main job, you could argue. I mean, unless you unless your goal is to specifically grow your biceps, you know, more than other muscles, it's like it's probably most functional to just use it within compound movements of the yeah. whole, whole body. Yeah. Yeah. And so I went, the shoulder bridge was kind of the seed crystal for the idea and then I just kept going with it and I thought, okay, well then cat stretch moves the spine in both its ranges but there's not a lot of load in it. Well, how do you load it? Well, then, okay, you do cobra stretch with your knees off the ground and you do um, like an up-faced dog with your load in your hands and I kept playing with that and I was like, oh, so then you could just do high bridge and teaser and it's just the extensions of the same idea, you know, and so, all right, so hold on, just walk me through that a bit slower. So high bridge is a uh, base of full back bend where your hands and feet are on the floor. Basically in yoga they call it a wheel pose, I think. Is that right? Uh, yeah, uh, wheel pose is on your belly holding your feet. Right. But, uh, yeah, so, so, so Urdhva Dhanurasana or the high bridge is hands and feet on the floor in a back bend. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember the translation of that. And in then, gymnastics they'd call it a bridge. A thoracic bridge. bridge or a bridge, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and... And then, you, 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 yeah, so then a teaser position in – so you come down from the high bridge, sit on your butt and come up to a teaser. So you mm-hmm. flexors, extensors. And when I'm doing mm-hmm. the extensors, the flexors are lengthening. And when I'm doing the flexors, the extensors are lengthening. And you can – Right. Now, I, I just want to give a little tiny uh, – I just want to talk about the, the technique of the teaser there just for a moment to clarify that because maybe if, like uh, me, uh, you know, those of you listening, we're trained up in a more contemporary – or maybe even classical system as well. You know, when I was taught teaser, I was taught that the thoracic should be lengthened. So in other words, your thoracic's in extension when you're in a teaser. Um, But actually the original contrology uh, position for the teaser, like if you read Joseph Pilates' book, Return to Life Through Contrology, he specifically instructs that the back should be rounded. Uh, So the whole spine is rounded in the teaser. So the teaser is truly your your spine is flexed, your hips are flexed, your whole spine is flexed. Hmm. And, uh, you know, and I'd like, I don't mean this to be getting into the weeds of, you know, what true Pilates actually is or anything right, like that. Right, and, and, I, don't, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't mean for a second that if you teach tease with the spine length and that that's bad. It's like, I don't give a shit. You can teach it however you want and it's awesome. But just, uh, just to clarify, just for those of you listening, because a minute ago, Heath, you said, oh, in teaser you're working, the, everything's flexed. And I just thought, oh, well, some people out there might think, well, hold on, in teaser your thoracic's actually not flexed. Yeah. But, yeah, okay. the way we teach it, it's flexed. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that that that's sort of one expression of that idea. So then, then you kind of go, okay. Well, then the, actually, you only need you only need two exercises: high bridge and. Oh, great! So the whole Pilates workout is just high bridge. Okay, hi, hi, Raf. Welcome to your workout. Start with high bridge, move on to teaser, and then I'll see you next week. Okay, great. Right. And, and, and so <laughs> that the, must have been a popular the, workout. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to do ninety nine reps of that. And then, and, and then next week we'll do a hundred. Um, yeah. So, but as a thought experiment, it works, but as a teaching strategy for the general public, it doesn't work at all. Right. <laughs> um, and, but what I'd, what it did for me was, um, it kind of crystallized what I, how I thought about what everything, well, it, it let me look at every exercise that I was teaching or had taught and think, all right, well, where, how does that fit into that? You know, or does mm-hmm. it fit into that? And sometimes it doesn't, and that's fine. But it it, it was the difference between um, it was the difference between doing exercise to think that I have to fix something that's wrong with the person, which I was increasingly realizing I didn't need to think about that much. Just do shoulder bridge, and everything's ha- like even if those postural things are real, which turns out they're not. Just. Uh, you, you can solve it so much more easily than you even have to think about. And yeah. then there's this kind of nihilistic moment where it's like, well, what am I doing? I'm just making, just moving around. And like, okay, great. That's great. If you don't move, get moving. That's awesome. But if I'm teaching 25 classes a week, that becomes a little bit open-ended and unformed. And then, so this was the thing that went, ah, okay, right. Whatever I'm doing, is it and how does it move it move people towards those end positions? And the more I explored it, the more I realised it's, it's a little bit more nuanced than just full high bridge and teaser. Because firstly, the reformer changes the game, and it doesn't really address the legs. But then it was like, well, that's solved easily. That's like pistol squats, right? If I don't have any equipment, everything's headed towards a pistol squat. 
and a pistol squat is pistol where you, it's a one-legged squat with one leg straight out in front of you, basically your butt to the to, to your heel of, yes. of the stance leg and the, and the other leg straight out in front. And it's super hard, both uh, strength-wise and also balance-wise, like 99% of people tend to fall over backwards. And mobility-wise, yeah. yeah. So it really challenges your ankles, etc. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, you know, so there's a, there's a few exercises that I think that are visible within the Pilates uh, archive that are like this. You know, they're, they're, they're kind of, they hold lots of exercises within them and it's mm-hmm. a way to think about all of the other exercises that we call Pilates or, or what you add. And so, all right, so what do you mean by hold a lot of exercises within them? Oh, well, example. all right, so, a pist- let, so let's take the pistol squat. So we, we're well, hold on, with- can, can, we, can we take high bridge or teaser because oh, sure. those, yeah. those are Pilates exercises? Oh, well, I'd argue so is the pistol squat because there's a photo of Joseph doing the, the single-leg Russian squat on the reformer where he's holding the straps. Oh, yeah, all right, call it a, call it a Russian squat, sure. Yeah, but yeah. anyway, stick with so like so shoulder bridge, uh, high bridge. Wh- wh- where does that begin? Well, it begins with shoulder bridge because, and we're on the reformer now. So I've got my heels on the footbar, my feet on the footbar, and I lift my hips up. Well, that's the initial. The uni- when you do a high bridge, you're initiating your high bridge with exactly that movement. And then I've got my hands on the shoulder pads, and I'm going to go to the crown of my head. And before I even do that, I need to have. Mm, that's depending on who we're talking to. You have some reasonable pushing strength so before you go and do the high bridge push to your crown of your head because there's a whole lot of control challenges within that you just do lots of push-ups off the foot bar or pushing straps or pulling straps or anything that's going to build strength in the shoulder uh, and so there you've already got two lego blocks of your program you've got well you three footwork push the bed out and in which tends to bias to the front thigh shoulder bridge where you tend to bias to the back thigh, right? and then and that's also that's actually closer to the lift of the shoulder bridge, uh, to the the high bridge, and then hands to the shoulder pads, and then somewhere in there you're going to practice pushing down to lift your head off the ground, put your head on the bed, and then you can go into the head back series and the head front series. The head front series is easier because you can see the ground in front of you so i can i'm on, starting on all fours i'm going to put my crown of my head on the bed i'm going to hold shoulder pads or hold my head or whatever i'm going to do but i can see the earth whereas head back is harder because i can't see the earth i've got to do everything with all happening behind me and no one knows really what's going on back there so there's like an it's not harder muscularly but it's harder in control which is not mm-hmm. nothing um I'm, I'm flying through the progressions here semicircles another one so semi-circle. So, right, so, so, so sorry. So you. So what you're saying is that each of these exercises, say shoulder bridge and arms pulling straps and uh, footwork uh, and head back, you know, they're all uh, building blocks towards high bridge. And another way of saying building blocks is they're they're layers to mm-hmm. you know towards high bridge or they're they're stepping stones, they're components. They're 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 like a a partial version yep. of that you know full full exercise. Yep. Another way of thinking about it. Yep. Okay. Yeah, exactly that. And and the other way that I've thought about it is when someone says, "Why am I doing this exercise?" or which is another version of "Where should I be feeling this?" Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter where you're feeling this. We're headed in a particular direction. Or why am I doing this exercise? Well, I don't say it's for your hamstrings or your glutes anymore. It's it's part of a. It's part of high bridge. We're working towards high bridge, right? Whether we get there today or in ten years doesn't matter. But that's the the journey rather than the reason. Okay, so this ties into that notion of what you were saying about you know really kind of the helps you avoid falling into that nihilistic trap, which is well maybe it's not a nihilistic trap, but it's uh, you know the biggest benefit of, you know from movement the biggest increment of benefit from moving comes from not moving going from not moving to moving right so if you're sedentary and then you do any form of movement like do some gardening go for a walk play croquet you know do freestyle interpretive dance like whatever it doesn't matter any form of movement is like you know a bazillion times better than no movement and then going from doing you know unstructured movement to doing like more quote exercise where you you know measuring how much you're doing and getting the right dosage and all of that. Yeah, there's there there is additional benefit in that, but it's much less additional benefit than the amount of benefit you get from going from nothing to something. Something. 
Right. And so, and this is not to say that, you know, unstructured movement is bad. Like you said, like it's freaking awesome. It's great. If you like unstructured movement, fantastic. You know, more power to you. Do that for the rest of your life. It's all good. Um, and there is a style of Pilates, and I've, I've taught it as well, where you don't really, you're not really working towards a goal, you know, teaching Pilates. It's just kind of like, it's just a movement hour. You know, you come, we move, you know, we might do a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of the other, move the spine in all the directions, you know, have a bit of a stretch, a couple of push-ups, bada bing, bada boom, walk out feeling taller, it's all good. Yeah, it's great. Um, but it, but it's not progressive. It's not like, hey, last week we did two push-ups, this week we're going to do three push-ups. And it's not like, hey, we're, you know, last week we did the shoulder bridge, this time we're going to do the one-legged shoulder bridge. Next week we're going to do shoulder bridge with fewer springs. Next week, we, you know, it's not, it's not a progressive goal oriented you know uh, kind of game and which is mm. not a bad thing but it's mm. like it's a thing mm. and th- that wasn't uh, satisfying for you and that's why that's why you you know were seeking uh, something to, to to reach towards yeah and I, I want to be really clear like I don't want to create the impression that when I teach a group class everything is always moving towards high bridge um, and in fact I did go through a period and within no, the studio... half of it's moving towards teaser. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. But right, and so that's, that's what I'm saying is in my head, but that's not what I'm saying to groups. And I can count on probably two hands, certainly, probably one hand, definitely two hands, the number of times I've actually taken a general class to high bridge. You know, it's, it's, it's not that that's what I'm trying to achieve... But it was, like you say, it was uh, when I, in terms of like just moving, was uh, there are different ways that you can organize your class. You can organize it by flow, you know, like so that from one body position to the next makes sense. I think that's totally valid and I still think like that. You can organize it in terms of progressive load. So I'm going to try and make it harder for you every time you succeed. And I, 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 I support that and I do that with layers within each and every class. So what I'm suggesting, uh, and this, this idea of the three exercises, that's not mutually exclusive to other structures for, for classes. Mm. But mm. for me as the trainer, as the teacher, what I found was, okay, well, I've, I feel like I've kind of mastered the idea of the flow class, which is, for me, it, it's simmered down to only change one thing at a time. So we do a series of exercises in one body position. And if I change the foot bar, I'm not changing the springs. Or if I change your body position, I'm not changing anything else. And that created a really flowing class where people didn't spend a lot of time changing equipment. And I felt like I'd got a handle on that. And then I started to work on progressive load. And it was like, okay, so how do I make one thing harder progressively in the session and over time? Like you said, double leg shoulder bridge, single leg shoulder bridge, reduce the spring tension so it's harder to keep the bed on the stopper. That increases the work. And I worked through that and I felt like I'd explored all of that in a a wide variety of places and could teach it effectively. So I had all these component bits and then it was like, uh, is there like a more unifying theory that puts those component bits into even more order? And that was when the the idea of, oh, what's the end point? that you're taking them to, th- does that organise them into that place? And that, that, that's what I'm talking about here. So it's like I'm, if, I, if I'm doing footwork, in the back of my mind I'm thinking one day we're doing a single leg Russian squat. And that is not to say that we're trying to do that today, but it helps me to organise my thinking around the challenge that I'm offering to people and the progressions that I take them through. And... Um, yeah, so with, that, e- with each exercise, you know, there's part of you that's thinking, where is this going? You know, what's what's the progression from this and where does that lead to? Yeah. And the answer of where it leads to is either always either Russian squat, teaser or high bridge. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And, yep. And, so how, and so, you know, cat stretch is two of those. And you know, I'm leave, if you're listening to this, I'm going to leave you to figure out which two. Uh, <laughs> and we'll reveal it at the end of the show if you listen right to the end. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, in that exploration, I, I've found that the one that I did in the, it was a community session just this morning for for Breathe was that I explored was an exercise um, that I've come to know as long back tendon stretch, which is kind of a it's, well, it is a combination of tendon stretch where you 
well, tendon stretch and long back stretch. Tendon stretch being where you're facing the shoulder pads, standing with the arches of your feet on the front edge of the, the foot bar end of the bed, hands on the foot bar and straight legs. And you push the bed out towards the pulley arms and you bring them back. And I'm going to inverted commas traditionally, as, I, as far as I know, it was done on relatively heavy springs. Uh, and then long back stretch where you the same start position except that your feet are at the shoulder pads and you push the bed out and lift your hips up into what on the mat would be called uh, leg pull. Leg pull. Yep. And what I found was that if I explored long, uh, if explored tendon stretch by reducing the spring tension, it got harder to bring the bed back. So it went from kind of a push the bed out <laughs> action, <laughs> yeah, right, to kind of like you're almost pulling the bed back in and having to push your hands into the foot bar more. And then I challenged that more. This is in my own explorations by dropping the foot bar, and I started, and I realized, oh, when my foot, because I'm not short, but I'm not crazy tall either, but I'm a bit too tall for most reformers to do the things the way they're meant to be done. So I lowered the foot bar so that I could get, so I could stop hitting the pulley arms on a lighter spring and realized, oh, I can do a leg pull position and then tendon stretch. And then it was like, well, actually, wait a minute, that's... The whole extensor system and the whole flexor system. Functionally the same as going teaser high bridge little bit and less you don't challenge to, you on You don't the, have to roll over. You don't have to roll over. You don't have to change and you don't have to be quite as flexible. So it's like less challenging in one dimension in the sense that you don't have to be as flexible for the high bridge as you would for the, 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 um, the leg pull position, but significantly more challenging in terms of it increases your heart rate. Um, there's a lot more control because you're dancing with the bed and, and challenges the range of motion in the other direction because teaser is not particularly challenging in flexibility. Like I know it can be for some people, but if you can touch your toes, it's not. Whereas tendon stretch on a low foot bar is significantly challenging for your flexibility. So it's like, oh, it's sort of the same, but slightly different. And, and again, but, and, and so then the similarities are there. It's like, it's, it's cat stretch plus some other stuff, you know, like, and what's the other stuff? Well, we can build that. And, that as the and the example I gave this morning is like if someone if so because if someone can't do tendon stretch, that's what, that. So when I'm running a group class, one of the measures I have for myself as success is that everyone in the room is moving in doing exercises that they can succeed at all of the time. Now you can't always get that right all the time, but that's the the aim. It's like I don't want anyone. To, to stop and go, I just can't do that. I don't have the capacity to do that. It's like, mm -hmm. I don't mind if you're doing it and it gets too hard and then you have to stop. That's not the same thing as I simply can't access that movement. Um, and tendon stretch is one of those movements where sometimes, and I always tell this story, I'll tell it again, my partner Jo, she has a relatively long spine, relatively short arms. So she physically cannot get her hands to the foot bar when she sits on the foot bar. So we, she's found a solution to that. She makes her spine shorter by flexing, right? So she's got a, a solve for that. But not everyone can do that or they can't find it or maybe they, for various reasons, they have even shorter arms relative to their body and they can't get that movement. Well, so they just don't have the shoulder strength or the... Right, they don't whatever. have the shoulder strength yet or the flexibility yet or whatever. So then how do you, how do you succeed in tendon stretch without doing tendon stretch. Well, elephant is tendon stretch, which an elephant being where you stand on the bed with your hands on the footbar with straight legs and you push the bed out and in. It's exactly the same shape with less flexibility demand. And so that was, you know, one way I taught that to people to think about that is if you want to do tendon stretch do ele with the group, do elephant. And if someone can do elephant with their hands on the footbar, they're probably good to have a go at long back stretch. And if they can do elephant and long back stretch you're two-thirds of the way to tendon stretch and you've just succeeded at those two movements and if you frame that for a class and say we're going to couple those two movements together and do a thing called tendon stretch then if you can't quite do tendon stretch it's not the same thing as the instructor going now we're doing tendon stretch it looks like this oh you can't do it you just failed because mm -hmm. what you've done is you've taken some steps towards the thing and you've tried and you didn't quite get there today. You know, you're not there yet as opposed to never seen it before, mm. don't understand the components, can't do it, I'm no good at Pilates. And that's 
for me, that's failure as an instructor. Mm. Does that make sense? Long back, yeah, because long back stretch is like the bottom part of tendon stretch. So when, you, when you're in tendon stretch, as you push the carriage out, you're basically doing long back stretch, except your feet are on the front edge of the bed instead of the shoulder pads. But basically it's the same, same move, same muscles, same position, slightly different range of motion, but not much, you know, not much. It's probably tendon stretch is a little bit easier in that bottom part compared to long back stretch. Um, but it's the, it's the lifting up part of the tendon stretch that is harder. And that, so that's where people, if they can do long back stretch uh, and elephant, they'll be able to do the bottom part of tendon stretch. They may or may not be able to do the top part of tendon stretch. Yeah, and it might be the transition they can't quite get. So you could, mm. you could do your tendon stretch. We go, okay, let's stand on the bed, walk your feet back to the edge and put your hands on the footbar. Now let's mm-hmm. sit on the foot bar and push the bed out with your feet on the front edge. Yeah, yeah. And we want to try and put those two places together, you know. Or you could just put your foot on the bed and help them along a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so you, 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 you got to this point where you realise that basically, you know, there are 500 exercises or thereabouts in the Pilates, full Pilates repertoire, you know, depending on whether you count modifications or preps or whatever, but, you know, roughly 500-ish. And they all are some, you know, version of, well, not all, but like most of them are some version of either teaser, high bridge or Russian, one leg Russian squat. Or if you wanted to say another way, they're all some version of tendon stretch or long back stretch. Or Russian squat, or they're all some version of cat stretch, or Russian squat. You know, really. I mean, if if there are only three exercises in the world, you can pick any three because they're all, you know, <laughs> as long as you've got a forward bend, a backward bend, and some kind of leg movement. Now, of course, you could we put could put an asterisk next to that and go, oh, and there are side bending exercises as well, and there are rotational exercises, and there are bilateral hip exercises, and there are shoulder flexion exercises. So it's like, yeah. We could subcategorize and go, yeah, actually, there's 500 different kind of exercises in the world. Um, but it's actually, I think, uh, just it's much more uh, useful as an instructor. It makes life a lot easier to, to, to pigeonhole all these exercises or most of them and just go, yeah, oh, that's just a version of cat stretch. That's just a version of tendon stretch. You know, that's a, an easier version of tendon stretch, you know. Um, uh, and then because then that allows you to, one – Rather than having to hold like 500 pieces of information in your mind, you only have to hold three pieces of information in your mind, right? When you're looking at an exercise, you're thinking, is this, is this high bridge, is this teaser, or is this Russian squats? <laughs> you know, <laughs> pick one. Um, and then, uh, second, and secondly, it makes programming a lot more kind of straightforward because, you know, wherever you, the client is at, when you find the level that they can do right now, well, it's kind of obvious what the next thing is because you know what you're working towards is like, you know, tease along back stretch or high bridge, uh, uh, sorry, um, tendon stretch, long back stretch or tease a high bridge, okay? Or, or whatever, you know, you could think I'm working them towards snake and freaking rocking, you know, it mm-hmm. doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, pick two really hard <laughs> exercises, one for flexion, one for extension, and everything, you know, leads up to or is a version of, you know, that. And so you might say, well, you know, wherever they're at, if they're currently, their ability is they can just do cat stretch, well, great. Okay. So that's step one on both of those paths towards tendon stretch. You know, there's your, your, you know, your angry cat. And then towards long back stretch, there's your, you know, Whatever extension. Cat. Whatever's yeah. going on for that cat. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Not angry cat. <laughs> Um, uh, and so that sort of gives you, you know, a much, a really simple framework, I think a straightforward way of, of categorizing and thinking about all of those different exercises that you've learned in the repertoire and going, oh yeah, I can see how they fit together, hmm. you know, and you can, and if you've got different apparatus, if you're working on Cadillac plus the chair, plus the reformer, plus the mat, plus the whatever, you can go, oh, well, I can see how, I don't know, you know, if someone can't do roll up on the mat or maybe the roll down with the roll down bar on the Cadillac would be an easier place for them to achieve that because it's the same range of motion but it's less strength requirement you know so you can you basically and all of those are working up towards tendon stretch 
Hmm. You know. Yeah. And so you, what? I've, yeah. So and what? What you start to do then is look at all of the things that you know or see on Instagram or whatever, and you're looking for similarities rather than differences. So it's, uh-huh. and it seems to me that if you can focus on the similarities of things, it's it's easier to make sense of the differences. You know, you go, oh, if I squint my eyes, those two things, yeah, okay, that's that's cat, that's that's angry cat plus that arm. Okay, cool. As opposed to mm. what is going on there? That's not like anything I know. Yeah, mm. and I, I just like I think something because of, we're talking at the beginning about where this came from the way I think about this came from, it came from looking at multiple bodies moving at once, you know, like, so again, looking at the similarities, like, okay, wh- where are people struggling? Where are they succeeding? And all of that. And it was all, you know, nested within group reformer, which is still, as far as I'm concerned, group fitness. It's, it's group exercise and people do it because they're part of a group. Um, they, they feed off the group energy. They like, the amount of anonymity that fits within that. It's general, you know, for all the reasons people love group exercise. And so, which you're managing so many people's personalities and preferences and all of that, that you can't make everyone happy all the time if you try and find out what everyone wants, because there's too many people in the room. So I have to have, I have to have a, a set of guidelines that I want to work to that hit you know, make the most people happy the most of the time as possible. And that's quite different to the way I think about uh, small group programming, because in small group programming, I'm, like you said, I'm doing multiple one-on-ones. So I actually think about small group exercise completely differently. I think about what is it that you need to achieve in this session and why are you here? And I'm going to build your program around that functional outcome. Like what are we trying Mm -hmm. to achieve together? And it might overlap with this, but I don't use this thinking framework in my clinical classes mm. at all, really. I just, it's, not, it's not part of my thinking. But as soon as I'm standing in front of a group of, you know, anywhere between four and 13 reformers, then it's like, all right, get you moving, looking at the, where you're succeeding, where you're challenged, what direction are we heading in? And I am thinking like, okay, what's the next step? Then the next step, then the next step, and the next step. Oh, we just hit appropriate challenge. Let's do another set of them and then we'll move on. All right. I want to just unpack that because I think that's, that's, this is really the, the, the core and the valuable part um, of, of, of this whole uh, thinking. So, you know, where are we heading? Well, we're, we're only heading one of three places, right? We're either heading to Highbridge or we're heading to Teaser or we're heading to uh, One Leg Russians. Yeah, and like just like you said before, we could we could we could basically interchange that for high foot bar, low spring snake. Right, that's another right. one, but it's yeah. still cat stretch, right? It's right, like, yeah, right. So we're heading to basically we're heading to you know insert you know some version of a high level challenge extension exercise, and so, or some version of a high level flexion exercise, or some version of a high level leg exercise, <laughs> right? So one you've. Pick one, pick one of one of those three. Yeah, right? that's what we does all three, right? <laughs> um, so, we, so where are we heading? Has got you know one of three possible answers, um, and uh, then we find the appropriate challenge. And the way that you uh, find the appropriate challenge, uh, which you kind of just kind of hinted at there, is that you start with a ver- just Say we're heading towards teaser, okay. Well, you pick, you pick a version of teaser that you're 100% certain everyone in the room can do, right? So let's start with cat stretch, right? Very, very confident everyone in the room can do cat stretch today, all right? So we start with cat stretch, and then we go, okay, look around. Can everyone do it? Yep, everyone's doing it. Great. What's the next version after cat stretch? You know, f- you know on, the, on the road from cat stretch to teaser, you know, what's the second stepping stone? You know, cat stretch is the first step. What's the second step? Well, it might be, I don't know half roll up it might be the hundreds it might be down dog you know whatever right there's a bazillion different choices there and there's no one correct answer but yeah what is what is a small step from cat stretch towards teaser um and then all right look around everyone's doing that great everyone's doing that great what's the next step everyone's doing that oh no a couple of people are struggling with this one all right so that's their level you two stay here 
everyone else, we're going to do whatever the next thing is. And you just keep doing that until everyone reaches their appropriate level of challenge where they're succeeding, but only just. Did I, did I capture that? Yeah. Yep. And if you follow what you just described through logically, what you might end up with is nine people doing quite disparate movements, even though they're on the same progression. But with practice, it just becomes, it becomes a bit more cohesive. And it's like, you know, if, uh, so the the the, the, uh, the the thing there would be like, well, what would we do? We got cat stretch. You can do that. Great. Uh, then now we'll sit and do a half rollback. And now we'll do a full rollback. Or now we'll do the roll up, right? Or oh, well, that is the full rollback. So roll back, roll up. Okay, great. Uh, we're going to try the roll over. And if that's too strong for you today, stay with the roll up because the roll up is the roll over with slightly less range of motion challenge. And then, you know, we might take the roll over to a jackknife just because, I don't know, that might be fun. And also, it, you know, it's a bit of extra challenge. And then which one were we heading for? Teaser, right, because the, and then go for the teaser. We might do some compressions, sit up and lift both legs up in front. So, and the way that I would think about that is, is everyone succeeding? Yes. Okay. Am I, and then I'm going to add challenge and I tend to think of it in terms of the three dimensions. So if I want to, if I'm, if I want to challenge them in strength, how am I going to do that? Or if I want to change the range of motion, how am I going to do that? Or challenge the control of the end movement. Um, so for example, like there's a movement I teach just more often than I care to think my clients probably just roll their eyes. It's called, I call it a tuck up. So you just lie. it's, it's sort of, it's you lie on your back and you roll up to a ball position. So it's like, what is it? It's the roll up meets rolling back, right? So you roll from completely supine arms overhead to a full ball and lie down. You know, it must have been done by humans since time immemorial. And, but what I love about that is being able to come up and balance on your buttocks and then lie down again. That is the, when you can do that, your body is capable of pressing into the straps and coming up to a teaser on the reformer. You might not be able to do it yet, but I can look at you and I know you have the capacity to do that movement. So that would be like, that would be me thinking about a basic mat movement that's heading for reformer teaser. And I'm thinking about it in terms of the coordination challenge. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm. And I want to, pull out what you said about control there because, um, and I, I don't want to go like super deep into this, but this is something that I th have been thinking about. Uh, you know, obviously control is an important part of Pilates. Uh, you know, it's right there in the name, contrology. Um, uh, and I, I th you know, my personal opinion is I, th I think a lot of people confuse control with just moving slowly. Like I, 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 you know, I, I, I hear the phrase and see the phrase quote slow and controlled end quote, you know, so much like, and sure, that's a thing. Like you can move slowly and with control. That's totally a thing, but you can also move fast and with control, you move blindingly fast with control, you know, like think about, you know, those skiers that go down and have to sort of go diagonally past all of those little witches hats or whatever that flags or whatever they go. I don't know what the name of the event is, but, um, uh, you know, like they're, they're, you know, soccer players who have to par, you know, sprint and pass the ball with high precision to someone on the other side of the field. Like speed and control are not mutually exclusive. So I, I think that's uh, just, I think something that just, we, the, we've, we get confused about sometimes in Pilates. Totally. A complete. So, well, that's the speed time continuum, right? Like the, the faster you do something, uh, is it speed? So speed accuracy continuum. Speed accuracy, yeah, yeah, speed so accuracy trade off. Yeah. The faster you do something, the harder it is to be accurate about what you're doing. So right. you learn something slow and then right. do it faster. And that, but that's, that expresses control. Like if you can do it right. slow, well, all right, great. Maybe can you do it fast? Yeah, do it fast. Yeah. Or can you accelerate and decelerate? You know? Yeah. And a, a lot of, I mean, I've, I've had some, what should we say, internet conversations about this, but I personally believe a lot of what is in Contrology is actually the manage, creation and management of momentum, which is yeah. what you just said, right? Yeah. And the argument that you should do it all slowly all the time, it's like, okay, fine, do that. That's cool. What you're biasing to is being able to do it slowly with absolute control. But going into high bridge, super slow, 
that's really freaking hard, hard yeah. right? And so it's well, some movements, it, like coming up to teaser on the, the long box, if you try and do that super slow, that's a really hard way to do it, right? Right. But, well, that, that, I mean, part of what we learn um, you know, is really clear from the, um, the movement skill literature is that, um, you know, when, pe- when someone is hot, part of the definition of what it means to be highly skilled, at a movement is uh, it's more, you move more efficiently, right? So, and, and efficiency means more output per unit of input or in other, in other words, like per calorie of energy that you expend, you get more done, right? So you, you use less effort to do the same amount of work or you use the same amount of effort to do more work, mm-hmm. right? So you can run, I can run at the same speed as someone if I'm more efficient, you, I can run at the same speed using less energy, right? Or if I'm more efficient at doing teaser, I can get up to teaser, even though, I don't have as many ab muscles as the person next door to me. If I'm more efficient at the movement, I don't have to have as many ab muscles, right? Mm. So, so, and efficiency is something like I think that most people in Pilates would consider is part of the goal of, you know, of the process. Um, and it turns out that, you know, so when someone is highly skilled at something, like if you're a highly skilled runner, you're more efficient than a novice runner. You know, if you're a highly skilled gymnast, you're more efficient than a novice gymnast, you know. So there are people who can who are skilled Uh, at doing handstands who can do a handstand where someone who's got like shoulder muscles four times the size of that person can't do a handstand right because they don't have the skill of of doing the handstand so yeah but it turns out like what is movement efficiency so how do you become more efficient like if you're more efficient at running like how is that right and it turns out that a big part of it is taking advantage of momentum right (laughs) it's a big part of it so so when we talk about becoming more efficient like using momentum is that's kind of part of the game. Hmm. So if, if we're practicing moving without momentum, well, that's good, but it's, you're missing out on a big slice of the pie there. Mm. Yep, agreed. And, and so like, yeah, with teaser, it's like there's a little bit at the beginning where you should go fast. But then as, as soon as you've done that, and what by fast, I mean push hard against the straps. But as soon as you've done that, then you back it off. And as far you have as to control you know, the momentum, right? So you create, you push the ball off the top of the hill, and then enjoy the ride, rather than trying to do the whole thing pushing uphill, you know. Right. And and yeah, um, and so I guess what that takes you to is that you can do things super slow and make it extra hard, or you can do it really fast where you don't understand the movement, and probably just make it dangerous in that case, right? And there's an optimal speed to learn it at, um, and that when you do that, like, in, and, and, and just finishing that teaser idea on the long box, like I, when I teach teaser on the long box, I teach no straps, sit on the box, go backwards, eccentrically go down, lie down, come up and bring your knees to your chest, right? So you just do that same tuck position because I'm not, I'm bending my knees that makes them lighter, it makes my legs lighter and I get access to my hip flexors more easily. So I can, you know, I'm taking out rules that make it harder and then I add layers in. And when you can come up straight arms, straight legs, like, okay, now we'll grab the straps and go back to the bent leg version, right? So, it, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of going off into, because I'm trying to manage for, we, I'm going to make it easier in one dimension. When you succeed, I'll make it harder in another dimension, strength with straight legs. And then I'm going to go make it harder in control, but easier in strength so that you can focus on the control challenge, knowing you've got the capacity for the strength challenge. And I'm yeah. not saying any of that to my clients, but that, right. that's sort of what I'm thinking there. Right. Huh. Well, so you've got these uh, layers that you have that, you know, that you've kind of developed over time. And like you said, Okay, if we if we say you know we're starting at cat stretch and we're working towards teaser on the long box, you know what are the ninety nine steps in between those two points? Well, you know there's probably several hundred versions of what those steps are. You know there's no correct progression from cat stretch to teaser, but there are lots of possible progressions, uh, and some of them are kind of more clunky. Like mine might be like okay, you're doing cat stretch on the mat. Okay, now let's go over to the Cadillac and do roll down. Okay, now let's go over to the ladder barrel and do whatever. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yeah, we've done ninety nine exercises and changed equipment on each between each exercise, <laughs> or and some of them are much more flowing. Like we could do it all on the reformer, you know, 
and and just we could do like I know arms pulling straps and then arms pulling straps with a curl up and then shoulder bridge and then hip rolls and then like lots of different things we could work up to it right um and so what you're saying is over the years you've developed kind of a repertoire of um you know flowing progressions that you go okay if someone can currently do cat stretch and we're working up to teaser on the long box we've kind of programmed in what the what the steps are in between you know a and z there and so you know like okay well bam but but if if say they can do cat stretch and their goal is to do i don't know teaser on the cadillac we've probably got a different set of progressions that are basically the same shapes right but just on the cadillac right or vice versa on the mat or with a kettlebell or you know whatever it might be and so there's no one correct progression but there are progressions that are more or less you know flowing as in fewer position changes fewer equipment changes fewer disruptions to the to the sequence you know on a given piece of equipment you know starting in a given position right? and and you just have developed those over time by just doing stuff and going oh shit that really didn't work you know <laughs> i'm not going to do that one again <laughs> and then just gradually noticing what's working over time and going oh yeah everyone seems to you know be able to transition from cat stretch to plank you know pretty easily so that's that's a good progression you know um, yep. yeah uh, and i think the way that i that one of the ways that i've improved that quickly <laughs> like i did it slowly but when i've helped other people to work through it um mainly like in 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 our studio one of the things that is okay if you're going to if you're going to think about an end position whatever let's say snake there's a snake on a high foot bar with a low spring or actually just snake generally so the, a good question is what makes it hard and if you don't know go and do it right and yeah. and you know even and you do your and version so of you've, what makes it hard is going to be one of three things it's going to be range of motion strength or control Right. Right. It might be all three, all three. but it's going to be some combination of those three things. Yep, spot on. And if you spend time as an instructor thinking, you know, uh, uh, the other way I think about it is like a, like a recipe, like you're making bread or something. It's like how much control do I need? How much uh, strength do I need? How much range of motion do I need? And when I mix them all together, I get that exercise. So then when it looks like this, I've got the range of motion, but I haven't yet got the strength. And that would predict to me, okay, that's what I need to work on to build that strength. And they become the right. things that you then, and so you can work it backwards and go, I'm going to go and do the exercise. What makes it hard? Or I'm going to do it with someone, a friend or a loved one. Why can't you do it? What's the bit you're missing? How would I build that? But once you do that a little bit, then you can build it, build it, build, you can build it forward and go, okay, we're going to go in that direction, which is building the strength. And we're going to go over in that direction, which is, range of motion and they might be completely disparate right they might not seem to be connected but then when you lego block them together it's like hey remember we did that hands in straps thing on four springs right and remember we did that forward bend with the back rowing where your hamstrings were stretching those two things are going to couple together now that and turn into that equals, stretch. yeah or, or they could t couple together and turn into snake correct yeah sorry that's right we were talking about snake yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah. Well, tendon stretch is basically snake, right? Just yeah. snake. It's a twisted tendon, tendon stretch. Twist. Yeah. 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 Huh. Well, uh, I'd love to, you know, I'd love to know, uh, for those of you out in the Pilates stratosphere listening to this, I'd love to know how this conversation landed because this is a little bit out of the ordinary for our normal convos here on Pilates Elephants. I mean, we've got super technical in the, the exercise repertoire and we've fired off a whole bunch of exercise names uh, and I'd love to know if, if that made sense to you, if that was helpful, uh, you know, if any of that was, was uh, confusing, controversial um, or anything else um, for you. Uh, and so you can uh, DM Heath or myself on Instagram and our details will be in the show notes. Uh, and, uh, yeah, is there anything else you want to add to this, Heath? Yeah, I think it off? so. I just, like, um, I, I guess I wanted to just maybe say, uh, like, I, I'm – I've I've had the good fortune to train in a number of different movement systems, for want of a better word. I've done martial arts, done yoga, um, I've done Pilates and and others, but they're the, the three big ones. And oh, you've done two 
did two different forms of martial arts. You did Kung Fu for a number of years and you've done Jiu Jitsu for a number of years. So, now yeah. Well. So like if you double click on them, I've done more things within them. And I've also spent a lot of time training with kettlebells and I've also done lots in the gym. And I've also spent a lot of time working on body weight strength. So if you double click on all of them, I've spent lots of time with different movement thing um, systems. And I suppose what I, what I've come to is, um, for me, and I don't mean this is how it should be for everyone, when I'm teaching reformer Pilates, I want to do it in a way that is engaging with the equipment. You know, it's like if I just want to build strength, I'm, I could probably do a better job of pure strength built. Well, I definitely could elsewhere. If I just want to do cardio, I could do a, a, a better job of cardio elsewhere. But I can do a, a reasonable job of both of those things on the reformer in a way that harnesses the unique characteristics of the reformer you know the fact that you're uh, horizontal to the floor on a bed that moves back and forth on rails with springs that increase and decrease the tension as the bed moves out and in I, I like teaching in a way that uses that rather than just tries to make it do you know like yeah and I, and and so by tr by wanting to work with the equipment is is um when i started to look at that classical repertoire, which I, I didn't actually get out of my stock training, interestingly enough, and maybe it was there and I just missed it because I was thinking about posture types. But once I started to work into the classical shapes a bit more, I was like, ah, oh, like tendon stretch. I love tendon stretch because it expresses the reformer so beautifully. It's like, as the bed goes out, it's harder against you, right? And so it's harder to move the bed, but it helps you come home. And I find that it's like, I like teaching in a way that harnesses that for the client rather than rather than not harnessing it and just simply thinking in terms of can we make this heavier or can we make this more flexibility challenge. It's like let's do something that shows you that it's easier in one way, harder in another, and then it's easier in the other way and harder in the other way. And it's like... Mm -hmm. Is, that Depending make sense? on whether you add more springs or take them away. Right, and then you start and, to play with spring tension. It's like, wow, the, it's, it's got lots in it. And, that's, and that is that skill aspect or that control aspect where, you know, as you push the carriage out in tendon stretch, for example, the springs stretch so they resist you more. So actually the further you go out, the more, the more the harder it is to push it. And then, you know, each inch is harder than the inch before it. Whereas on the way back in, like the first inch is uh, really easy because the carriage is, but as you get further in, it actually gets harder and harder because the springs assist you less and less. Um, yeah, so that's a real, that's a skill and learning how to use the, you know, harness that momentum of the springs on the way up so that, you know, you get a bit of a run up at it <laughs> is part of the skill of getting good yep. attendance stretch. Yep. And that's exactly right. And so it becomes that skill of creating and managing momentum and, and, and I, yeah, I, I really like that. I, I like that about the, I think that's the, I think that's the, particularly the reformer. I'm going to put my foot in my mouth. No, no I think, I feel like that's kind of, that's the gem that the reformer offers the fitness world. You know, if we look more broadly, because like kettlebells gives you something, barbells training gives you something. And what does the reformer give you? Well, it gives you this peculiar practice in the skill of momentum and and flexibility and uh, and some strength but like i said at the beginning it doesn't take that long like what I, I find myself saying a lot lately pilates is great for strength until it's not and then once you run out of load you got to go elsewhere to do your strength training which is not the same thing as saying stop doing pilates right right so if if you want to keep progressing your strength you know at some point you're doing footwork with all the springs on and it's like well where do we go from here footwork with all the springs on on one leg and by the time you're doing 15 yeah. reps of that you got to go somewhere else yeah. but by the time you're doing that you could start doing the russian squat on two legs and when you can do that holding the straps then you could do it on one leg and then all of a sudden it's it's, it's strength but there's got so much control in it that it's not yeah. optimized for strength it's it's optimized for reformer pilates and that's awesome right 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 good talk yeah, thanks, Ref. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.